You're listening to Puma Podcast. Hi, I'm Bella Perez Rubio, Puma Podcast. Rodolfo Pong Biazon, former lawmaker and former military chief, died of pneumonia at the age of 88 on June 12, 2023. He was diagnosed with lung cancer last July 2022. He passed as the country marked its 125th Independence Day. In this episode of Teka Teka News, we take you inside the defining moment of his distinguished career in public service, and we hear all about his life from his biographer, Eric Ramos, and veteran reporter, Apa Ong Pin. We owe this guy a lot. I mean, he saved Philippine democracy you know, back when democracy was really under siege. That's Eric Ramos, who wrote the authorized biography, Rodolfo Biazon, Soldier, Solon, Statesman. After the Edsa Revolution in 1986, President Cory Aquino came into power. And then he was practically her knight in shining armor. No? He defended the government from a series of coups d'etat. There was one coup after another. Uh, there were, I think the total count was somewhere between eight or nine over uh, the next four or five years. So the Cory government really didn't have much of a chance to prosper because there were all these uh, military men plotting against her. And stopping all these coup plotters was this guy, Rodolfo Biason. One coup in particular is remembered by many to be the deadliest and the closest rebels ever came to overthrowing the government. It was the same coup that made Biazon a household name. This was that December 1989 coup, but again, General Biazon saved the day. It was his finest hour as a general, but it came at a high price because there were so many casualties and Many of those casualties were his fellow Marines. The investigative committee, formed by the Defense Department in 1990, said 99 people died while 570 were injured. The coup began in 1989, but a full account of the events published in the official gazette notes that Biazon had suspicions as early as November. Later that month, Brigadier General Biazon would call for a reserve marine team to augment forces in anticipation of the coup, only to learn that they had defected to the rebel side. In December, the very same troops would try to breach Camp Aguinaldo as Biazon defended it. A profile of Biazon, co-written by veteran reporters Manny Mogato and Apa Ong Pin for the Manila Chronicle in 1990, recalled that the general oversaw the defense of Manila atop the Camp Aguinaldo Grandstand, standing there as enemy fire rained down around him. I spoke to Ong Pin about the same infamous coup. General Biazon was uh, head of the National Capital Region Defense Command. In the 1989 coup, It was obviously a loyalty check, right? The, the way that Ramos did it in 1986 was, you know, the minute he holed up in Isano, he was on the phone constantly calling people, saying, hey, look, we're breaking away. Can you join us? You know, that sort of thing. Biason didn't have that option. He couldn't negotiate with people. Basically had to take all of the troops that he could and defend Camp Aguinaldo. And the rebels were this time very well equipped. I mean, they had artillery, they had armor, and they had some air, right? So it was not a good situation. But, you know, Biasa, the combat veteran, and he rose to the to the challenge, obviously. You know. um, and, and uh, you know what, what I felt about it? I was a reporter at the time for the Manila Chronicle. And what I felt about it was that What really was remarkable about this guy is that he's not matapa, you know, he's not a coward, but he was not like brave in the face of this uh, terrible danger. He was afraid and he fought his fear. It's clear from footage at the time that President Cory Aquino felt the same way. 
I declared that the rebels would rue the day they conceived their evil plan to destroy our country and our freedom. That day has come. Secretary Fidel Ramos and Chief of Staff Renato de Villa and General Rodolfo Biason declared that the back of the mutiny would be broken today. Yesterday afternoon, our forces went on the offensive and we are putting with the attack until the last trace of resistance is removed. This, word for word, was how reporters Ong Pin and Mugato described then-Brigadier General Biazon in the opening lines of their profile piece. Six feet of lean, camouflage-clad, athletic flesh and sinew. Neither muscular bulk nor spare ounces are apparent. Towering upward, ramrod straight to a chiseled face topped by a steel-gray crew cut. After this coup and his exposure on television, he is unforgettable. He is Mars incarnate. He would make a hell of a statue. But as Biazon's name carried across the airwaves, many of the reporters around him noted that he was visibly distraught. Here's his biographer, Eric Ramos, again. The evening after that battle when he crushed so many fellow Marines, he was interviewed by uh, ABS-CBN. He, they ran the full interview. And then he was really uh, crying, uh, crying his heart out. Because while he saved the day for Philippine democracy, it also came with so much casualties for his fellow Marines. Fellow Marines whom he knew, whom he fought with in the battlefields of Mindanao. And he he had to fight them. And yes, a good number of them were killed. So it came at a high price. And he was really very conflicted about it. He became really famous after that. So famous that... Political pundits started calling him the next Magsaysay. So the implication, because uh, right immediately after that, the SWS uh, poll rated him as the most popular government official in the country during that time. Uh, He was even more popular than Cory, Ramos, and the AFP chief of staff at that time, General Renato de Villa. So he was so popular that Viva Films was going to make a major movie about him. So, so yun, that was his finest hour. The, it was his biggest triumph as a soldier. But historians call that kind of victory a pyrrhic victory because personally, and dami niyang regrets about it. Apa Ong Pin was one of the reporters who witnessed all this. He had interviewed Biazon even prior to the 89 coup attempt and profiled him shortly after. That's what I think was so remarkable about him. He's a very human person. He could be very emotional. He was actually a loving uh, person, you know, but also very principled. And uh, he felt terrible that he had to shoot his fellow soldiers, that some of them had to die in order for him to defend the flag. But that was his uh, sort of involvement in the thing. He... He wasn't just doing his job. He knew that he was making a choice to defend the country. And it wasn't for him a political choice. In the case of ETSA 1986, his action was to take no action, was to stay out of it, right? Therefore, denying the Marcos side his support. But in, in 1989, his choice was to fight. For all he did to keep Edsa alive, the term fence-sitter is often used to describe Biazon's involvement or non-involvement with people power. But there's more to the story. He was technically not an Edsa hero because he stayed in Davao. No? He was the commander of the Marines in Davao. So he stayed in his camp. He kept himself incommunicado, I think, because he was trying to avoid possible calls for re- reinforcement. He really didn't want to take part in it because the Marines commander at that time, who was his mentor, uh, General Artemio Tadyar, was tasked by Marcos to crush the rebels who were up Karame. Uh, and then si FVR, General Ramos, spread the rumor that Biason had already defected and was there with him in Camp Karame. This was to psych out Tadyar because Ramos knew that 
just mentioning Biason's name. Tremendous effect on uh, junior Marine officers. But it wasn't true. He stayed in Davao all this time. But actually, he had a very important contribution to EDSA. Uh, about a week before the revolution happened, he was in talks with the uh, chorus organizers in Mindanao. No? Cori's biggest bankroller, the biggest financier of her campaign, was lawyer and businessman Jesus Chito Ayala. This is a relative of the Ayala family who was based in Dabao. No? Colonel Biazon vowed to Ayala that he would support Cori because there was this plan that in case Makagulo sa Manila, because there are already all these cool rumors, Makagulo sa Manila, Cori would run to Davao and put up a provisional government in Davao City. So Biazon vowed to protect Cori. Technically, he was not an EDSA hero. He did not have any direct involvement in the uprising. But in Cory's eyes, even then, he was already his knight in shining armor. So that's a very important point that's not very widely known. So far, we've only covered about a week or so of Biazon's decades-long public service career. After leaving the military, he went on to serve two terms in the Senate and one term in the lower house. As a senator, he took part in writing the Philippine Archipelagic Baselines Law, which defines the country's maritime territory. Nearly 50 years before, in 1961, he was one of the first members of the Navy to volunteer for the newly formed Philippine Marines. He was also the first commander of the 3rd Marine Battalion. Here's his biographer again. Biason was the OG of the West Philippine Sea. He had a very long relationship with the West Philippine Sea because he was the operations officer of the Philippine Marines, operations officers of the top secret task force composed of Marines and Navy officers who occupied the islands we now know as the Kalayaan Group of Islands. And when he became a congressman after leaving the Senate, he was invited to The Hague during the hearings for the, the adjudication for the West Philippine Sea dispute against China. He was there as an official observer because the court recognized his status. Listen to Biazon in an interview with News 5 in 2021. The uh, involvement was mula pa noong 1968. 1968, na kung saan binuon uh, former President uh, Marcos ang isang uh, task force upang okupahan yung mga isla natin dyan sa West Philippine Sea. Tayo po ang uh, nagbigay ng pangalan doon sa mga isla na puro Tagalog. During his time in the Senate, Biazon authored laws that provided pensions to soldiers and veterans of World War II. Other laws he wrote increased the salary for members of the armed forces and paved the way for its modernization. He also passed laws seeking to ensure affordable housing and socialized housing for the poor. His son, Rufi, has served four terms as Muntin Lupa's representative in the lower house. He's currently the city's mayor. But still, there's more to Biazon than that. His biographer says his entire life could be a movie. He was born in Batak, Ilocos Norte because his mother was uh, an Ilocana. This was in 1935. But he was raised in Cavite City because that was where his, his late father was working as a baker. He grew up in poverty. Actually, mas mahabang kwento yung uh, all the odd jobs that he did as early, from as early as eight years old. Because his father died one day after his eighth birthday. And he was the panganay of the family. He had three younger sisters. So solo parent agad yung mother niya. And during the war, he and his mother became ano, itinerant barter traders. No? They went all around the province of Cavite with a cariton, no? with a push cart filled with uh, assorted goods that they would barter with townsfolks all around Cavite. And then... When they got back to Cavite City, they would trade those goods sa Palenque. So that's how they lived during the war. And then after that, he became a market vendor. Because when, uh, when the Japanese Imperial Army declared martial law towards the tail end of World War II, they couldn't travel anymore around the province. So 
they just put put up a cord snack stand in the city palenque in the city market uh he sold binatog a delicacy corn kernels and also uh yung corn on the cob grilled corn on the cob his family lived in a slum in leverisa pasay after the war they lived right next door to a u.s army encampment in pasay so the whole family in fact became La Bandera at La Bandera for, for the American servicemen. So that became their mother's trade for the next several years after the war. But aside from being La Bandero, he also tried other jobs. Newspaper boy, yung uh, nagkakalakal. You sell uh, whatever can be sold to junk shops, old bottles and knickknacks, whatever. He also had a very interesting uh, Job. He was a brothel room boy. <laughs> Imagine that. Early teens, must be early teens. The job was called a palanganero. He would bring in a basin filled with water to the room so that the, you know, the clients could use it for uh, washing up. I asked him if he knew what was going on at that age. Sabi, oh, wala naman akong pakialam sa ginagawa nila. Pa- <laughs> nagawa nila sa loob. Most of the clients were American servicemen at that time. So, yeah. The brothel was in Kulikuli. That's the present-day Arnais Avenue, or used to be called Pasay Road in Makati, uh, right across the Pasay City cockpit arena today. And then another important job he had was cigarette vendor. He was a cigarette vendor at age 11, and he became a chain smoker at that early age. So all the reporters who covered him knew this, that he was... A chain smoker. So it's quite quite a miracle already that he managed to live so long. But because uh, I wrote in the book that he was he was lucky to have very uh, durable lungs. <laughs> of course, I didn't know then that uh, he would end up getting lung cancer eventually. But still, you know, he lived to uh, a very ripe old age of 88, despite being uh, nicotine dependent for much of his life. Another job he had was he also became a waiter at teacher's class. Baguio City. And that's when he saw, the first time he saw PMA cadets in Baguio. So that left an impression on him that maybe I could be like them. Maybe I should apply for the academy. Although after graduating high school, he enrolled at FIATI as a mechanical engineering student. Hindi niya natapos yung freshman year niya. Because at the same time, again, he was a working student. Yung una, he worked as a septic tank excavator. Imagine, at that time, that job was done fully manually. They would use pails to collect the that poop. And, and because he was the tallest guy in the crew, he was the one who had to plunge himself in the tank and poop out the, the sewage and pass it on to his uh, crewmates. So, and then, yun, ano na siya nun, ha? imagine that, college freshman na siya. And then from there, he only did that for mga two or three months. Uh, for much of his, of his freshman year at Fiat, he was working as a caminero, road construction worker at the Pasay stretch of uh, Highway 54, which would become EDSA. So I would also assert in the book that, you know, he paved EDSA. As a Philippine Military Academy cadet, Biazon struggled. In fact, False claims that he finished last in his class would follow him throughout his career. A goat is the kulelat of every PMA batch. No? So he's the last cadet in the order of merit. The problem there, so in the case of PMA Class 61, which was Biazon's batch, he was not the PMA goat. In fact, his, his grades were mediocre. No? So Minado, he was a so-so cadet. He was number eight from the bottom. He was number 48 out of 56 graduates. No? Yan yung malaking misteryo. Eh. Somehow that stuck. And then when Biason was going to run for the Senate in 1992, he realized that everybody was already calling him the, the goat of his class, no? the uh, PMA class 61 goat. So he ran with it. So... Up to now, when you Google this topic, makikita mo talaga, he's the PMA GOAT, he's the GOAT of his class. Even his bio, his write-up in the Senate website, 
yeah, it says he's the PMA good. So not surprisingly, all these uh, obit stories last Monday can repeated this lie that he's the PMA good, which is not true at all. He wasn't the valedictorian. He didn't get high marks as a cadet, but he was not the kulelat of his class. So right now, that's one of my missions ngayon sa me to, you know, supplant this, this inaccuracy. But again, how do I do that? My uh, counterclaim is he's the PMA GOAT. GOAT as in all capital letters of all time. So my book is a comprehensive argument about that in support of that claim that he is the greatest pma -er ever. A necrological service honoring Biazon was held in the Senate on June 20. Later that day, he was laid to rest with full military honors at the Libingan ng mga bayani. And that was today's episode of Teka, Teka News. Again, I'm Bella Perez Rubio. This episode was edited by Joe Salcedo. If you like this episode, share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to follow Teka, Teka News and Puma Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. At para sa mga mahilig manood sa YouTube, Puma Podcast na rin po kami doon. Just search Puma Podcast and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for listening.